appreciate you being on the, uh, the call with us today. And welcome to the onset of another contracting year. You know, uh, every year, for those of you that have been doing this a long time, it becomes fairly routine. But one thing we've learned about this year is that there's nothing routine about it. Um, we have had so many changes with the way that we do things uh, in lieu of the coronavirus, um, the contract terms, so many things are changing each and every day. And I just want to tell you that I've got a, I've got a great staff. You know a lot of this staff. We do a lot of great things. Um, but by all means, this is a great opportunity to ask those questions. If you really do not have a clear understanding, this is the perfect time to ask those questions. The odds are you're not going to, if you don't know the answer, there might be somebody else out there that doesn't know the answer. So please don't hesitate in asking questions when it comes to these kinds of things. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Mark Hutek, the CEO of the organization. Um, and uh, just a couple quick things before I pass it off. I, I do want to tell you that we've got some real positive notes coming down the pipe for you all. One thing that we have learned from many of you is that this uh, economy has wreaked havoc for some of your centers as far as getting qualified teachers into your programs and keeping staff. We understand what's happening around us in the economy. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why folks aren't necessarily working with you right now and or leaving or changing or whatever. So one thing that we are starting to uh, look at, obviously, is how we can assist with that. And we have started reaching out to Career Source of Polk County. And we've also reached out to Polk State College with the ideas that, uh, you know, maybe we can offer some kind of a job fair uh, in which you all can be present and we can allow prospective candidates to be screened and maybe look at help placing some of those positions. So you should be receiving, if you didn't receive it already, you should be receiving a survey in the near future uh, that's gonna ask you what your interest might be in something like a job fair and um, whether or not you would be interested in participating. And of course, we also would like to know whether or not you've got vacancies. So we can tell if we've got an issue with hundreds of vacancies in Polk County or just a handful of vacancies in Polk County. So we'd really love to hear from you when you get that survey, survey please fill that out. And then secondly, I wanna tell you that, you know, we've done a lot of rounds of grants um, uh, from most of those have come from either coalition dollars uh, that we've been able to uh, basically rob Peter to pay Paul on, or they've come from the state in the form of uh, um, stimulus dollars or those kinds of things. In one way or another, we've gotten that money from the state. The good news is, is that we were on a phone call this morning and we have been told that there is a um, big chunk of money that's going to be coming to the coalition. And when that money comes, uh, it's bigger than any grant we have put out yet. Uh, when that money comes, it will be going back to providers again. So yay, we do have another grant coming. It will be bigger than um, probably any grant that you've received to date. And I can promise you that we work as expeditiously as we can when we know that that money comes, uh, we will get it into your bank accounts as absolute fast as we can. So uh, on a positive Friday, happy note, we will be having another round of grants coming sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, as soon as we can get the details on it and as soon as we can get the dollars, uh, we will get that to you as soon as possible. So anyway, I wanted to start with a couple real positive notes. Um, we've got a fantastic staff that's going to work you through this contract today. And I will, at this point, turn it over to the VP of Programs, Cheryl Kelly. So Cheryl, take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. And thank you, as Mark said, um, after this crazy year, it's been, wow, something for all of us. But we appreciate your constant communication with us through the grants and through all the different things that have been happening. So um, please continue to communicate closely. If you need anything, we are here for you. I just wanted to make um, just a mention of some changes that are um, going to be coming. Um, as they relate to the quality staff and the quality unit here in the coalition. As we move through the next few months and um, get closer to the July 1, the, the new contract year, um, you will be seeing some more emails from us and some about the changes, just outlining what's maybe gonna happen um, as far as staff are concerned. So we do, all of our quality specialists are still here. They're still working with us. You should continue to contact them just as you always have. 
um, for anything that you need related to your programs. Um, but soon, a few staff will be kind of shifting um, as far as their positions and their focus and their roles. So um, just to kind of align us with where the Office of Early Learning is going and some of their initiatives, and the direction they're taking. We have a couple of staff who soon will be focusing more on very specific things. So one of those, uh, for instance, is infant toddler technical assistance and training. We are going to have one person handling that um, or at least leading that for the coalition. One of our quality staff will work solely on um, inclusion and sort of child assessment related child assessment and screening related things working with our screening specialists in that in that capacity and then um, early literacy actually nancy walker as many of you already know she leads no more's bright start for us and does some other big literacy initiatives she's going to be taking more of that focus and broadening what we're already doing in literacy um, here in the next few months and then throughout the next um, year so we'll be sending you out those changes we do have a few staff who will also transition from you know, the caseload work and working directly with you every day into doing more professional development and more specific um, just class assessment. So that class piece, as you all know, is really big. Everybody has to have, have an observation. We're going to talk about that as we go through the contract today. Um, and I think everyone is aware of how that works. But to be able to best support you, again, we're just transitioning some of the staff to um, be able to concentrate a bit more on that and help you in different ways. So we're splitting up assessors and technical assistants um, to some degree. Um, and then professional development, we've got exciting news as far as we've expanded our space here in the Lakeland office and have a new professional development center as we call it. It's a, a big training room here. Um, we're, you're going to see a lot more coming out in terms of courses and trainings and partnership that we're going to have with, um, you know, other agencies and, and just things that we want to do again to align with school readiness and VPK. And Sheila Chambers, who was the program manager in the Winter Haven office um, for quite a number of years now has transitioned to now overseeing professional development. And Blanca Fernandez, who's on the call today, um, has moved into Sheila's previous role as the program manager in Winter Haven. So I think that's important for all of you to know. Those of you on the east side of the county, if you have any needs um, or anything in regard to quality, you can call your specialist or Blanca, and I know she'd be happy to help you. So, um, and then we have a number of specialists who will remain in, in, the, in the quality specialist role that looks much like it does now, well, where they will be your, your um, first contact um, in regard to everyday needs, things that we can support you with. And um, so you may or may not have the same person. So we'll see how that looks moving forward. I wanted everyone to be aware. And once again, we'll have more information as we move into the next few weeks. I think that's it for now. Um, and so I think I'm gonna pass it now to Karen, who's gonna get us started in the contracts. Again, thank hey, you all for being here. Cheryl, there was a couple questions in the chat related to PD. Um, you can see those. Are you going to offer in-person training? Several of my staff have asked for them as they don't like online. So we are. So um, we do plan to come back to in-person trainings soon. I think everyone knows that we've been doing the best we can with virtual over this last year and it has worked well. But I think everybody's kind of ready for some in-person and seeing, <laughs> seeing one another. So um, our plan actually here at the coalition is, is um, in June. Um, we'll be opening our doors. I guess it's okay for me to put that out there. And I don't know if Mark or anyone else wants to comment on that more to the public. And then at that point, we're going to get rolling with, you know, looking at some more face to face kinds of opportunities and then moving forward. Fingers crossed that all goes well and things continue to hopefully um, look up as far as COVID is concerned. You know, we hope to get back to that normal routine of having face to face. And then will there be PD opportunities for teacher certification points? So that is a great question. And that is something that we are working on. And that is part of what we're trying to do with PD is really do something that's not just in service, but figure out how we can go through and, you know, work with our partners, if that means become possibly ISET accredited, those things to be able to offer um, more certifications or higher level um 
you know, credits of some kind. So stay tuned on that. It's we we do have a lot of work to do, but we're we're already in it. We're talking to a lot of folks, and Sheila and I and the rest of the group are working on that. So good question. Any others? Did I miss anything? I don't see any. Um, if if you can, uh, when you ask a question, if you can put it in the Q and A box, that way everybody can see that we can respond to that those questions either live or. Uh, we can type those responses in, but that way everybody can see it and we can make sure that there's a record of it, um, you know, for other providers that may may have those same questions. So thank you for those questions. Thank you, Karen. All right. Hello, everybody. As most of you know, my name is Karen Hallman and I am the contract and compliance manager here at the Early Learning Coalition. And we are going to walk through and try not to put you out of sleep. Um, pieces of the uh, contract for both school readiness and for BPK. So we're not going to go word for word, but we are going to hit some really important pieces. And I say we because I'm going to have Nancy Moses and Melinda too. We're all going to go through this with you all. What we have in front of us, and I'm going to share it, is the draft version. Um, from what we hear, the live versions are coming very, very, very soon. But before we can do those contracts, uh, your profiles to make sure that those are due and completed. It's by May 5th. Uh, so we do need those profiles completed and submitted. And then once they're moved to an active status, those 21, 22 profiles, that's when we'll be able to get it to initiate your contracts. Okay, so I am going to go ahead if somebody can um, share with enable so that I can um, share my screen. Let's see how that and then I'm gonna share the contracts with you all. All right. You should be good now, Karen. Perfect, and we can see it. Everybody can see the school readiness. Welcome. All right. So welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you here. Um, I know we have to do this virtually. And as everybody had mentioned, this has been a cyclone of a year, so to speak with COVID. So it's great to see everybody on here and so many people and those of you that can't make it live on this and that will be watching that later. Uh, welcome into the new 21-22 contract year. All right, so we're gonna go through step by step. So as we mentioned before, one of the big things is the profile. Beginning May 1st, all those 21-22 profiles are supposed to be due and there's a number of you that are out there that have not submitted your profiles. So I wanna make sure that you are aware that those are due. With that being said, we've provided, and you're gonna get resources. If you haven't gotten them yet, you should have a packet that would be for like school readiness and VPK. Normally we give you the hard copies when we see you at the meetings, but we had to do them electronically, obviously as we're doing this, uh, you know, virtually. So one of the great things that I have for you listed on here is for school readiness contract checklist. As you're doing your profiles, this is very useful. It's very helpful because you're going to see different things that you're looking at. One of the big things is we're doing profiles. Please, please, please make sure your DCF license is up to date. That is an expired. Make sure there's no lapse. Anytime there's a renewal of your license, whether it be that it's just, let's say, a provisional or a probationary or the annual license, Make sure that you're putting all of those copies in there so that there aren't any gaps or holes. Same thing with your liability insurance. We want to make sure that you're aware, you know, making sure you have that liability insurance uploaded that has us listed as the certificate holder and as, adi as additional insured. And with that being said, there cannot be any lapses in liability insurance and your coverage has to be for the entire year. So I'm saying that because if there is a lapse in, the, uh, in your liability insurance, that is grounds for and can be for termination of the contract. It can also will be a financial penalty for any lapses that occur. So make sure that you put that you know, on your radar that you're checking that as often as possible. And then I'm not gonna go through everything in here, but you'll have this checklist. So as you're going through, just making sure that you have those items within your profile. So when we get to your profile, and all of you should be familiar with the profile, it is the statewide system. Everybody is using that. 
When you're in there, uh, you're going to switch over to your 2122. When you do that, go into your profile. For those of you that haven't done that yet, 2122 just won't like magically appear. Uh, you're going to go into your profile. When you go in there, there's going to be a little blue tab. And you're going to get this lovely little resource as well. And it's not going to be black and white. You're going to have a pretty colorful one. But at, above the top where it says program year, right at the top of your profile, you're going to see that click on that little tab and it'll switch it to the 2122. Make sure that your, uh, your, you know, when you're doing that, your other profile, your 2021, if you have one, is active so that you can submit your 2122. Again, go in there and make sure that you're completing that because we cannot initiate a contract unless that profile has been completed and we don't want your contracts getting delayed. Delay in profile can be a delay in contract and starting July 1, so just keep that in mind. And I'm just gonna keep this going because you're gonna have a copy of that. And I just keep scrolling and keep scrolling down. Hopefully I'm not making anybody dizzy. If so, look away. So if you have questions with your portal for right now, there is the, um, obviously the help desk, but you can reach out to myself if you have questions as you're doing your portal, or you can also reach out to Sheila Bishop. And there's Sheila Bishop's contact information as we're rolling into those 2122 profiles. All righty. Now that you have your profile submitted, we will be initiating those contracts. So what do these contracts look like? There are some changes from last year to this year. So we'll go through that. All right, you get to that section here. So obviously you're here with us because you want to provide school readiness services. Something new on there that you're gonna see for some of you, there's EIN and social security number. Just know that there's the E-Verify and you should have received an email throughout the course of this year. It's been, went out a couple of times. And so with that E-Verify that is gonna require for all providers, school readiness, DPK, all providers will have to have an EIN number, so there won't be the social security number. And that is in here. We'll go through that a little bit as we go down into the contract. Okay. So obviously, you know, the purpose of your contract is that you want to provide school readiness services. And again, like I said, I'm not going to read everything word for word because I'm not going to put you out of sleep or attempt not to put you out of sleep. So the terms of your contract is gonna begin July 1st of this contract year, so that's exciting. And obviously to be eligible, you've gotta be one of these. You've either gotta be a child care facility, a family child care home, a large child care. Those are the terms of the contract and I'll let you read that at your leisure. Or a public school or non-public school from that's exempt. All right. So as we move on, so I'm going to just keep going into the eligibility piece, and this is under that section C of your contract. Again, as a business owner, it is your responsibility when you get these contracts to make sure that you read these contracts inside and out. Really get to know them. Get to know the language. You will have access to it. You can download it. You can print it. It's going to be in your portal. Highlight stuff if you want to print it off. You know, keep it somewhere that you're reading it and that, um, you know, you're looking at what it is that's in your contract because ultimately, you know, you're accountable for meeting these terms of the contract. Okay. So one of the things is just making sure, obviously, that you're not on the disqualified list. So that would make you ineligible. I'm just going to keep moving. One of the big things that you have to have that it does talk about that is a pre-contractual inspection conducted by the Department of Children and Families or local licensing agency. So you know that every year DCF comes out and they do their inspections. So that's making sure that you've had your inspections. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch out because you, as you know, um, there is a threshold that you have to come in on that's changed just slightly this year, but there is a threshold and it 
there is tied to the contracts is the class scores. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to have Nancy just touch on that piece of it. And then we'll continue to move through pieces of your contract. Thanks, Karen. Let me just put this up. Okay, so what you see in front of you there is just a quick overview, just some reminders about class and QPS for school readiness providers. Um, this is only if you have a school readiness contract. If you are only a VPK contract, this is not for you. Um, but the first step for those of you that do have this is your quality performance system, keeping that up to date. That is the system that you go into. We talk about it all the time. QPS, that is where you're making sure we have all the information we need to know in order that we can go out and do your assessments. So whatever is in there has to be super accurate because based on that is how we plan and prepare for your assessments. And as Karen mentioned, obviously you have to have a composite score in order to have your contract. In order to get a composite score, you have to have your assessments. In order to get assessed, you have to have QPS correct. So it all starts in QPS. Um, some things that we need you to remember. Every time you make a change, please email your quality specialist. I know that feels um, redundant because you made the change in QPS, but QPS does not alert us to any changes. So if you could just shoot your quality specialist an email and say, um, you know, we added this new staff person or someone left, or even you changed uh, teachers, you know, your two year old teacher is now your three year old teacher, something like that. And then every month, by the 15th of every month, you're going to go into QPS and you're going to review all of that, make sure it's correct, and you're going to submit your roster. Super easy. If you haven't had many changes, it will take you a minute, but that is something you have to do every month. So really quickly, in QPS, you want to include all of the teachers who are in assigned classrooms. So if your teacher goes to the same classroom, she's in the three-year-old classroom every day for the most part, um, that's her classroom. She needs to be assigned to that classroom. Same with assistants. Directors also will be in QPS, even if you're not assigned to a classroom. And then all of your active classrooms will be listed in QPS. And an important part of that is to make sure that you look at that and let us know which age group that classroom serves, either infant, toddler, or pre-K, because again, that's how we'll know what class assessment to do. So a few things not to include in QPS. Do not include floaters. The people that help you out just kind of fill in. Don't include floaters. Don't include substitutes. Don't include anyone that's really not assigned to a given classroom every day. And don't include school age teachers for classrooms. So this is only school readiness. This is only the permanent set classrooms and teachers. Okay, so that's QPS. You have any questions about QPS? Good, okay. Regarding your class assessments, it's pretty much the same way we have always done it. Um, with the added uh, little piece of COVID. So all that means is we're just being extra careful when we come out to you. We won't be visiting any other centers at that time, any of that day. Um, we're gonna be extra careful about everything that we have on our end for our own protocol. And also if there's anything particular or special that you have, you can let us know that. We'll do whatever we need to do to make you and your staff and your children and families comfortable. But as far as what we've always done and we're gonna continue to do, when it's time for your assessment, you'll hear from your assessor. That person will give you a two week window and they can come out and do the assessment anytime during that two weeks. The exception being, you can block out any three specific dates. If you know that your teacher will be off that day or it's picture day or something like that that just wouldn't work well for an assessment, you can block those out. And then an important thing to know is a teacher must be assigned in, in the classroom for 15 days before we can do an assessment of the teacher in the classroom. So not just that she's employed by you for 15 days, but she has to be assigned to the classroom where we are doing the assessment. And as far as getting ready, work with your quality specialist, work with your staff here. As Cheryl said, we have all these staff members, we have people focused on really different areas and we have our quality specialist team it is there to provide resources to you. We can, we have um, digital virtual resources. We can talk on the phone. We can uh, brainstorm all kinds of things. And we want to do that with you. So tap into the resources that you have here because we really do 
think that you will be really successful. We've seen some great gains. We've seen some great things happening in our providers with our providers. So we think you'll do great, but just let us know if you need our help. There's my information there. I think you have probably most everyone else's information and let us know what we can do to help. Thank you. All right, everybody can see my screen okay? All right, so as we move on here, thank you, Nancy, for sharing that information. So as we were talking before, uh, you know, the different pieces of the, the eligibility. We're gonna move on. One of the new pieces that you're gonna see within here, um, as we talk about, uh, you know, coming into the contract, is the e-verify. So you're gonna see that's new in your contract. And what that e-verify is, it's within here that you are not subcontracting with an authorized alien is what it is stating within your contract. And so what you're gonna be doing is you're going to make sure that you've registered. You all should have already by now. Um, Kenneth has sent you an email somewhere around January about this coming. It is now in the contracts. So you're gonna be signing a form that's gonna basically validate that you said that you've done this. It'll be an attachment that you're gonna get. There'll be one for the school readiness as well as one for the VPK programs. And that is a requirement per the state now and that is within the contract. All right, some fun new stuff this year. We're not gonna talk about contracted slots because we're not doing that. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about child enrollment here. And like I said, I'm not reading everything word for word. You all can uh, have some stuff at uh, your disposal here to read. Okay, so with the child enrollments, so basically what this is saying that is that you agree to enroll eligible children for your school readiness program with authorization from the coalition, which will be provided in a form of child of a child care certificate from a single wide information system, which is obviously the MOD system. So as you know, services begin and end the date uh, identified by the coalition on a child care certificate, or if the child's eligibility is terminated prior to the end date. Again, I'm not gonna read everything in there, so I'm gonna move on to child care and talk a little bit about that piece. So under child care, obviously you agree that you're gonna provide child care and supervision to the children that are enrolled at your child care program. And then with instruction activities, you would just wanna make sure as it says in here that it's age appropriate and developmentally appropriate. And then we're gonna go down to the general health and safety you know, same thing, you just want to make sure you're providing a healthy and safe environment for the children within your care. You're maintaining that supervision. Those staff to child ratios are important. You know, DCF comes out and monitors that. We have staff that comes out and monitors that. So just making sure that you stay within ratio. Background screening with your staff, making sure that, you know, that they've had their background screening. Your staff are up to par on their training hours, all of that fun stuff. All right, we're getting moving along. So we're gonna talk a, just slightly. Um, there is a possibility of an improvement plan. I am not gonna get in the weeds with that, but just know that there is, if you come at a certain threshold, you could be on an improvement plan where you would have to have uh, certain trainings just to help boost you back up those class scores. Making sure that it, your environment is smoke free and then your curriculum. There's a curriculum that came out this year. Everybody had to do an update from the state, just making sure that as you move into the new contract year that you have the most current curriculum. At the end of this, there is an attachment that has the curriculum. You can also go to the Florida Office of Early Learning's website and look at their curriculum on there just to make sure that you have the most current curriculum that's approved. All right, we're moving along. So we're gonna go down to developmental screening and I'm gonna step away from this piece. Melinda's gonna step in and she's gonna talk a little bit about what this entails because there were some changes with that as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing and Melinda's gonna take this piece. 
Can you see it? Okay. So good afternoon. My name is Melinda Q. Kentrell. I'm over the developmental screenings, which we call ASQ. Um, as you know, ASQ, um, the screening process has changed um, over the years, and we have a new change, and hopefully you're able to attend uh, the meetings we had about the changes at the end of March. Um, so as we know, screenings are required as a part of school readiness. It is part of the rule 6M-4.720. Um, we have to stay in compliance with this rule. So that is why sometimes Aaron or Seisha will call you and say, hey, we need a screening. Um, it hasn't been turned in um, because we're trying to stay in compliance. We want you to be able to stay in compliance too because we get audited a lot on, on developmental screenings. So um, there are major changes. Um, it was effective April 1st. Some of you probably have already seen and gone in and seen the new changes. Um, some of you might not. Um, right now, the change looks like you're doing the ASQ3 and the ASQSE. This is how it's set up currently. They are working on trying to take the SE out, but right now you are required to do the SE, which is the social emotional um, screener too. So all the screenings now must be completed online. We do not want paper form, fax form, scan forms. We won't take those. They have to be done through the OEL provider services portal, which those um, are where you do your child attendance and I believe your contracts and everything you do for school readiness. So when will child need developmental screening? This has changed also April 1st. So first of all, new enrollment. On the new enrollment, what's going to happen is the parent is going to be the first screener. Um, and however, the parent can defer it over to the child care providers. So this is where you will have to be required to complete the um the ages and stages three and the se so that is on new enrollments and as we know protective service children sometimes are enrolled um a lot um every like three months six months and if this starts happening we really don't want you to keep completing a screening on the child so what i would like for you to do is just reach out to aaron and Sasha, and they can help you with this issue um, also, um, if we feel appropriate, um, screening needs to be completed on a child and we usually do follow-ups if there's concerns, um, we can ask for you to do uh, a follow-up screening and those would be in the same um, process. It would be in the OEL um, service um, portal and it'll be in your queue. And also at redeterminations, these are shown as new enrollments also. And so if the parent does not complete it, then the provider will be able to complete it. And we will have to have, stay inside of a 40 day completion. So Aaron and Seisha is going to work closely with you on that. So no more screenings by the birth month. Those are gone. So if you were unable to attend those webinars, um, you can request the link to be emailed to me. You can um, email myself or Aaron or Stacia, um, the screening specialist. They'll be happy to help you with that. Um, one big change is you will not be notified when something is due anymore, just because um, we did that in the old, um, early um, in our ELC um, provider portal where you used to do your ages and stages. However, no more notifications. And so you're going to have to start looking into your, your queue in the portal. Um, and we recommend weekly to see if you have any screenings due. 
And then this is my contact information, plus Sasha Sanchez and Aaron Canton. And also, if you have any IT issues, please, please, please email the help desk at elcpoll.org. If you have any questions, please just put it in the questions and answers. There was, there's a question in the uh, Q&A box, uh, Melinda. Some children are listed with an SE assessment, but others don't have the SE. Is there a way to add in the SE if it's not listed? Um, no, I don't believe so. But um, let me look at that question further and I'll answer it, okay? And then there was one more, um, uh, Melinda, it said, why is the parent allowed to send it to us? Do they? they know the child better than we do. I, I, I agree, but this is how the system works. Um, and so it's required that all school readiness children birth to, um, to five years of age be screened. So if the parent does it, it just defers it. So I agree, but there's nothing, we can't stop it being deferred. Um. There was a question about slide three. We're actually going to email the slides out to everyone, uh, Melinda slides out to everyone so that every, you guys will have those uh, following this meeting. Uh, and then there's also one more question. It said, will we, will we be able to still send in children's ASQs that are not SR children? Yes, please contact Sasha or Aaron and they'll send you the link on how you can do that because under inclusion, we can um, we can look at any private pay child and assist with that with parent consent. I think that's all of them. Okay, and I'll look into that one. All right, great questions, everyone. Great questions. Thanks, Melinda. Okay, so we're going to go back to the contract prohibited forms of discipline, child immunizations, and then program operation. I'm gonna let you read that at your leisure. Making sure, you know, obviously with your program operation that you're operating within the hours that you've stated with your profile. Workers' compensation and reemployment insurance. I know this comes up quite often. So making sure it is in your profile, there's an option for you to have it uploaded. However, we do have monitoring that will be happening throughout the course of the year for school readiness. If you are the lucky individual to get selected for a tier two monitoring, you, this will be part of the items that will be requested. So things that we would be asking for would be like the RT6 or the 940. I know even for BPK, that's part of the questions when you do BPK that we look at, as well as those sign in and out sheets. That will be for the tier one monitoring that occurs with school readiness. And that is everybody gets monitored for tier one, aren't you lucky individuals? And then again, a certain group for the tier two. When we're looking at those sign in and out sheets, I know it's a pain to submit them. We get it, but guess what? We get audited too. So just making sure that those Sign in out sheets are as accurate as you can get them. We know things happen, but we want to make sure that you're keeping them accurate. No white out, no X's, uh, you know, keep it clear. If you have to mark it, put a line through it, put your initial. Do not be signing for the parents, the directors or the teachers are not to be signing in, the children in and out. It needs to be the authorized individual of the children, which is like the parent, the caretaker, whoever's authorizes that, that individual that needs to be signing those children in and out. When we go to those child absences, which is a little bit different than the Riley Wilson Act, but with those child absences, just making sure that you agree to notify the coalition in writing if a child enrolled is absent for five consecutive days with no contact from the parent by the close of the fifth day. So making sure that, um, you know, that you're notifying us. And then the Rila Wilson Act, that's, that's important. So with that being said, as it says in here, you agree to abide by the provisions of the Rila Wilson Act for each at-risk child under the age of school entry who is enrolled in that school readiness program. So making sure, you know, those best practices with that, if you have a child that is a BG1 child or a child that's at risk, 
letting us know that that child's not in attendance. So that's, uh, we've got a great resource at the end that goes hand in hand with this. Obviously with that uh, parent choice, the parent has the right to choose the provider and child care services for their children, parent access, making sure that, uh, that you agree to afford authorized parent unlimited access to their children in the school readiness program during those normal hours of operation whenever the children are in care at that program. Everybody has the single statewide information system, making sure that you know your, all of your documents are submitted completed up to par in that statewide system. Your child care resource and referral, that's Sheila Bishop. She goes through, she's the guru with that, just making sure, you know, if you have changes and staying even in contact with contracts, making sure that all of that resource and referral stuff is up to par within the statewide system. Hey, Karen, there's a, there was a question that came in the Q&A, and I, before we get too far from it, I didn't know if we wanted to address that one. Yeah, can you, are you able to pull it up, Kenneth? Yeah, I'm working on a couple of them right now. Uh, one of them is, if, if, I'll just go ahead and answer it live. If the child catches the bus after school, do you sign in? Um, obviously, if the child is, you know, arriving to your site, from a, you know, from a bus or leaving your site to a bus, then obviously the director will be signing that child in and out, you know, at that point in time. Um, but as far as, you know, the, the parents are dropping the child off, parents need to be the ones signing in and out. Uh, I do see one that says something about DCF said that we can sign the, the children in or out. Um, you know, if there is a safety protocol that's, that's in effect that doesn't allow parents to sign the child in or out because they can't come in the building. I know some of you have done that like during COVID. Um, <clears throat> that is something that that is permissible. However, um, just because you are signing the child in or out, we need something from the parent that is attesting that those those sign in and sign outs are accurate. So maybe you want to print out, uh, you know, something from uh, your system, maybe if it's a system, electronic system, print something out, have the parent attest that those you know, signatures of those timestamps in or out are accurate. It, it, it still has to be approved by the parent uh, at the end of the day. Uh, if, if, there are, if there are no safety protocols due to COVID, then the parent needs to be signing them in and out. Uh, I know some, some providers are still, have, you know, maybe their signing out method was a little bit different, uh, but, but we still need parent signatures uh, on that. Uh, who are exactly are we letting know about a BG1 child that is not in attendance? Uh, you can either let uh, your reimbursement specialist know, or you can let your uh, family service specialist know on that. Just make sure we notify the coalition. Uh, make sure you notify the coalition if, if, if those children are not in attendance. Again, that, that is a safety thing that's built in. Those children are protective services and they're, they're in your care. Um, you know, to ensure that their health and safety is being maintained and, and is being uh, upheld. So if those children aren't there, then they aren't in your sight, they aren't in your vision, uh, they aren't in your field of care. So, you know, we need to know so that we can let the appropriate uh, staff know uh, via case management um, to, to make sure that, that sh those children are safe. Uh, let's see here, what else do we have? I see it. You're saying that's not allowed. I'm not sure exactly what that referenced. Uh, Melinda's working on the ASQ question right now. I think that was all of them. Awesome, thanks. Okay, as we go into direct deposit, just making sure if you have any changes within your direct deposit that you've notified us. I'm not gonna go into um, you know detail with that. You can read that. The big piece is the orientation. That's one of the reasons why you're here. In order to contract school readiness or even BPK, you do have to sit through the lovely orientation piece. As we get to the child assessment, again, I'm gonna have Melinda take this piece of it. She's gonna talk about that a little bit. So I'm gonna pull out while she goes ahead and gives you some information about the child assessment.
have to unmute myself. <laughs> can you see that or what can you see? Can you see teaching strategies? Uh, child assessment, teaching strategies goal. What is teaching strategies goal? That's what we see. Okay, great. Um, just a little, um, just a little thing about teaching strategies. Um, child assessment is not required. Um, currently, we have about 75 um, school readiness providers participating in teaching strategies gold, and those providers are receiving a 5% differential on all their school readiness children just by participating in gold. And so I just want to talk just briefly about gold. Um, we've been doing as a coalition about uh, Goal. We've been offering it for about, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years. I'm not really sure, but it's been a long time. It was, we've been offering before BP, it even got into BPK that one year where it was kind of messy and it kind of gave um, teaching strategies goal the bad rap um, because um, the coalition, um, we really support gold and we really believe that gold um, is very informational for um, families to see where their children are, plus your teachers in the classroom. So what I wanna talk about is if you're interested in participating in teaching strategies goal, we like to work with you and try to get you going in it. Um, you know, one step at a time, we work provider with provider. Um, we want to make sure that gold can work with you and um, how your program works. And we have um, great staff that, that can help with that. Um, so I really just wanna say, um, give it a try. Um, if it doesn't work, it's fine. Um, but it really um, is helpful. It helps um, lesson planning. You can do lesson planning and a teaching strategies goal, and it puts all the goal dimensions on it. It relates to all your developmental standards, and it's all one shot deal. And um, so let us work with you one on one. If you're not participating in gold, um, please reach out to us because um, we want to help you and get you started. Um, and this is a good way. So in the new contracts, if you decide um, right now is when you can um, get involved and start going. And if you want to contact Kristen Granite, she um, can get you going and talk to you. And she gives great one on one support, um, coaching, training, and she's going to be going out into the field um, and working with um, the gold providers we have already, plus any new ones. So please reach out to Kristen because we would love for you to have that 5% differential payment too. And I'll stop my screen. Okay, if you have any questions, please reach out to me, thanks. Thank you, Melinda. All right, so as we move back to the contract, we're on item number 33, so this is great. We're moving down the chain here. This is These deliverables are a great visual. This is gonna tell you when things are due, and I'm not gonna go through all of that, but it is a wonderful visual and guide for you to have. I'm gonna tell you about the screenings and all kinds of stuff within there. Okay. Training and technical assistance. We have staff on hand here at the coalition that provides some great training, technical assistance. Please utilize those individuals. That's what we're here for. Melinda talked about the developmental screening on that piece. So I'm gonna keep moving as we get to that child eligibility. And as you know, under child eligibility, the coalition has a responsibility for determining the eligibility of the children enrolled within your school readiness program. Monitoring and access, here we go. So as we go into the monitoring and the access piece, so when I talk about the monitoring, you've heard me mention there will be tier one monitoring conducted and there is also a selection of individuals for the tier two monitoring. 
that is something that we are required to do and that we have to do. I know that you're like, ah, oh, but we do need those sign in and out sheets, all that wonderful stuff. So when we start calling you and sending you notification, please make sure that you have that stuff handy because there's a lot of you out there and we want to make sure that, you know, we're getting things moving as quickly for you as well as for us. Physical access. No, you can't block us from entering into your building. You can't lock your doors. You got to let us in. So same thing with DCF. And that's where it talks about giving the coalition or local licensing agencies, you know, um, any of us access to your school readiness program. Records and access that you agree to allow the coalition staff or subcontractors, uh, same thing. Um, you know, access to those records. There are some things that we're going to need to see for school readiness. So to be during those normal business hours of operation. And as it says in here, you know, we, we can request those records, you know, if they're stored off site uh, to be provided to the coalition within 72 hours. Just know that is in your contract. Where I said, make sure you're reading, reading, reading your contract. Obviously, keeping records confidential. Maintenance. This is a big one for all kinds of different reasons. It's stated in your monitoring tools. It's in your contract. We can't regurgitate this enough, but record maintenance. Just making sure that you maintain all those records. I know it's a pain, but you got to do it. It is in your contract, which includes sign in and out sheets, enrollments, and attendance certificates, that documentation to support those unexcused absences, proof of co-parent payments, all that fun stuff for a period of five years. So it's the most current five years. You do need to keep that stuff. Same thing if you uh, transfer or there's termination of your program, either by the provider or if there's a termination for cause, all of those documents need to be handed over from the past five years to the coalition. You will get a formal notice when that happens and that uh, we will make arrangements to get those documents over to us. Okay, compensation and funding. We know you want your money. So as we talk about that methods of payment, this is, this is a good one. So right here, as we talk about these items within this piece of the contract, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, provider reimbursement for eligibility of children will be based on the child care certificate, which is also known as a payment certificate. And for your reimbursement rates, looking at that, and I'm not going to read everything, but I am going to go through this piece of it, that that reimbursement rate, which is lesser than the coalition max rate reimbursement rate. And this piece uh, will be is established by the coalition and approved by the Office of Early Learning. So you can look at those pieces. Gold seal rate. I'm just going to touch a little bit about that. Where um, for those that you know that are gold seal, just know that that gold seal differential may up may be up to 20% above the Early Learning Coalition's approved reimbursement rate. The quality performance incentive rates is Nancy touched upon earlier, I'm not going to get too deep into that, but based on your class scores, there are different differential rates that are above and beyond, you know, what your pay is. So that would fall under that quality performance incentive rate. Same thing with that child assessment rate that Melinda was talking about a little bit. There is a differential if you're eligible for that for teaching strategies gold and you meet the eligibility requirements to be able to do that, there is a child assessment differential rate for that as well. I'm not going to do contracted slots, but I know Melinda will touch just a little bit on this number 50 with the special needs rate. If you have a child that has a um, IEP, IFSP, uh, diagnosed um, disability, um, you could be able to get a special needs rate, but we do have a process that you have to go through um, in order to get any special needs rate. So if you do, please reach out to me and I can go through that process with you um, and get you that special needs rate. All right. 
And then we go to rate change and limitations. As you all know that uh, early in this year, OEL did provide a increased rate for all the providers because we had lots of amendments that everybody had to sign. So that's great. But with that being said, so any rate changes that you're now doing, making sure that you're letting us know, you're reporting those changes to us. When you make those changes in your profile, letting us know because those rate changes do require an amendment. And then rates and fees for parents that you acknowledge that you um, are prohibited from charging parents receiving SR services at a higher rate than that charged to private pay parents. Co-payments. Just talk about this a little bit. As required by Florida statute, the provider shall collect the assessed parent co-payment or graduated phase out co-payment in accordance with that rule 6M-4.400. And I'm not gonna go into all of these um, co-payment pieces. You can read these pieces that are embedded within your contract. The holiday schedule. So as you all know, within your contract, you get approved up to 12 payable holidays per year. There's 13 that are on the exhibit that we're gonna give you an attachment that you can look at for this coming up contract year but 12 of them are the ones that you would select. Make sure that you put those in your profile if you're taking those holidays. Some of those holidays will pull over to your contract and unfortunately some of them aren't gonna pull over so you're gonna to have to make sure that you've manually added those onto your contract, especially if you wanna make sure that you're getting paid for those days. Okay, attendance documentation. As we talk about this piece, this is a big piece for you all. So listen, listen, listen. Okay, so you agree to document daily attendance and submit monthly attendance reports for payment. You agree to submit all the required attendance records to the coalition, here it is, before the third business day of each month. So making sure that you're submitting that, again, the third business day of each month. If the due date falls on a holiday, you're gonna to agree to submit all those required attendance records to the coalition on the preceding business day. Can't say I didn't tell you. Okay, for reimbursement, here we go on this piece. So for reimbursement summary review, this is another important piece because we see this a lot, okay? So you agree to review the reimbursement summary provided with the monthly reimbursement statement. You agree to report to the coalition any discrepancies, overpayment or underpayment within 60 calendar days of transmission of the reimbursement summary. Okay. Again, don't say I didn't tell you. For emergency temporary closure, you agree that all requests for compensation for temporary closures beyond your control will be handled in accordance with rule. And we know all this too far or too much with, with COVID this year, it's been a crazy year. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. You can read some of this other stuff. I've got to leave some reading materials for you all. Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole like reconciliation, Head Start, Title 20 schools. You can read through that stuff because you'll have your own lovely copy. Financial consequences. Just making sure there are, um, you know, a possibility of financial consequences as a result a provider's failure to provide the minimal level of services required within this contract. Uh, the coalition shall temporarily withhold reimbursement, disallow all of the parts of service not in compliance with the terms of the contract or which can lead to termination of the contract. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. You can read the piece on discrimination, non-compliance, and I know that, you know, sometimes it happens. Sometimes you get those corrective action plans that requires a corrective action notice. And so just making sure if you uh, failed to comply with the provisions governing within your school readiness program under that paragraph five, or with the requirements of your contract, the coalition concludes that a corrective action plan will resolve the failure to comply, the coalition must notify the provider in writing, which will let you know that's where you get our lovely non-compliance letters. 
And then uh, making sure that I'm not reading all of this, that you've submitted a corrective action plan. And that leads into probation. And sometimes that happens, um, you know, if there's multiple class violations, things of that nature that occur, uh, certain class violations, it could lead you, um, or, you know, a, a large number of class violations, it could lead you to being placed on probation for a period of six months, which can include trainings. Uh, there could be financial penalties associated with that. So I'll let you read that piece on your own, but just know that there could be a chance from probation and just making sure if you are on a corrective action plan that you've completed it prior to um, if, it, if it's due before the end of your contract and the start of your new contract, or it could even roll into your new contract. Termination for cause. I'm not gonna go heavy into this, but just know that the coalition has the right to terminate the contract for cause at any time. And I'll let you read up on that. Just making sure that when you read up on it though, pay attention to these numbers, 67, which is termination for cause, there's 68, which is emergency termination, or there's 69, which is termination for health and safety violations. And the reason why I say, because there is a little section that talks about that with uh, the revocation that could uh, happen with that under here. So making sure in accordance with this revocation of eligibility in accordance with statute, the con if the contract is terminated under those ones that I just said, those bullets, 67, 68, or 69, uh, the coalition can revo uh, revoke eligibility to deliver school readiness for up to a period of five years. So just making sure that you are familiar with those bullets. And then if there's termination of contract by the provider, just making sure, you know, if, and we know things happen, but the sooner the better you notify us, uh, as it states in your contract, give us at least 30 days out if you know that you're going to be terminating your contract, if there's a change in ownership, anything like that. What we don't want to do is we don't want to be disrupting services for those families. And, you know, the mod system isn't the way that it used to be back in the day, you know, the mod system has some things that we need to work out prior to, you know, any changes. So we want to make sure that you're giving us at least 30 days out. I'm not going to go into the legislative piece and then um, let's see, eligible child care provider, obviously knowing that if you fail to maintain status in the, as an eligible child care provider, this will be considered an immediate and serious danger to the health, safety, and welfare of children, which is grounds for emergency termination of the contract. Fraud, you know, you'll go, you can read this piece, just making sure that you're not committing any forms of fraud. And that talks a little bit under 75, under A, B, and C section of the contract. And you can read that, those pieces. And as we talked before, not being on the USDA disqualified list, should you be on the USA, U, USDA disqualified list, make sure you let us know within five days. I'm not going to go through the due process procedure. You all can read that. Same thing with the litigation pieces. Again, I have to give you some reading material. Okay, information change notification. Obviously letting us know that you'll comply with the following if it happens with your contract. Notice to the coalition of change in your contract or program information at least 14 days out. Uh, if you require an additional assessment, there's a whole thing that goes on with that and we're not gonna go too deep into that um, because there's certain stipulations even within that um, should, your, uh, should you need to have an additional class observation. If that happens, um, you know, you can reach out to Melinda too about that piece of it. Notice of temporary emergency closure, making sure that you're letting us know of any emergency closures. We need to know this by the close of business, the first day that the closing occurs, and then something to us in writing within two business days. Same thing if you're permanently closing, like we said, letting us know, report this at least 30 calendar days prior to that change. 
as we talked about CCRNR, just making sure any changes within your profile under that CCRNR that you're keeping that up to date. Um, you know, if you if you're changing your email, if you're changing emergency contact, any of that stuff in there, make sure that you're getting into the profile and that you're updating that information. Unusual incidents, making sure that if there's an unusual incident, you've made got to report that to the coalition no later than the close of business on the next business day and then something to us in writing within three business days of the date of the incident. If you're not sure if it's an unusual incident, notify us. You know, it's better not to say, it's better to let us know than not to let us know. Okay, as we talk about, you know, fraud, same thing, I'm not gonna go heavy into that. And then with, um, obviously with the amendment piece, I'm not gonna go into these pieces either. Um, you know, you can read these, you know, the indemnify piece and then um, the amendments. If there's an amendment, it's all done electronically now. There's no paper format of, um, you know, uh, amendments anymore. So everything's gonna be done in that mod system. When you're looking at your amendments, they're hidden. So when you're looking at where your contracts are, when you go to that contract section where your SR20 is, you're gonna see this little plus. And if you click on that little plus all the way to the left, you're gonna see it collapse and open and your amendment is hidden. If you have one, it's hidden in there. And then we get to the piece of the execution of the contract. So when you get to your contract, just making sure um, the signature of the individual that is going to be signing the contract is going to be on that top line where it says signature of president, vice president, secretary, officer, owner, so on and so forth. That's going to be that individual there. Uh, we've seen it time and time again. Just make sure when you're getting ready to sign, it's tricky. You think right when you get in there, you're going to be putting your signature, but it jumps up and says title. So pay attention. That's just a little tidbit of information. Um, when it jumps up and says title, that's where you're going to put your title in. Then it'll flip and then the name will pull up. And then you go to the next piece after that, which will put your signature in. All right. And then these are exhibits. So I'm not going to go into, um, you know, these will be attachments. It talks about, you know, gold seal, all of that fun stuff, which will populate from your profile. A lot of stuff that's in this contract, that's why it's so important to have your profile done and done accurately and correctly. Lots of stuff that's in your profile is what feeds over to your contract. So they are two different things. You have your profile and then you will have a contract. So just making sure that those are two different things. I'm not gonna go into the quality improvement plan selection. That would be if you were um, on an improvement plan, these would be different selections that you would pick based off of, you know, what is best with your program, should that happen. And then this just gives you a definition of what that entails. And it, it does go on and on and on these attachments, so I'm not going to get too heavy into those pieces. We're not looking at contracted slots because we're not worrying about that right now. Sorry if I'm making you dizzy, just look away. Um, this will pull from your profile over your rates. So you won't have to worry about filling that in that again, that's going to populate from your profile. Ooh, there's an added new really cool little piece that breaks. You saw this this year, which is really nice because it breaks everything down. But there's this, a new little thing that's added. Look at this, this is pretty cool. So this is a new piece of the contract, which is really neat. It gives little codes, talks about like the maximum hours, like full-time, full-time and part-time, which is really neat. This has been added this year. And it has a little calculation of wraparound payment rates, which is really cool. So that gives you how to convert it, which is really nice. Here's your holiday schedule. Look at that. 
Um, that's what's going to be in your contract. And then again, you're going to have to probably add some extra days in there. You get 12. That's just the due process. We're not going to get heavy into that. And this is the second piece based upon whatever your child care facility is. If it's a licensed daycare home, it's going to populate one of these. Again, making sure the big pieces is that health and safety piece, making sure you've had those inspections, staying uh, with your group size and ratio, make sure that you're maintaining your ratio, keeping your insurance up to date, that general liability insurance. And then your substitute instructors, anybody that you have in there, the hours and background screening is all up to date with those individuals. All right, still going, still going. Great resource here that Kenneth has provided. And you're gonna get this as an attachment. This is a quick guide to attendance submission. You will get that. Yours will be colorful, not black and white, like mine and grainy. So that's going to be a really useful, helpful tip for you. Oh, look at that. There it is. Oh, the Riley Wilson Act. So this is you're going to get this resource as well. So just making sure gives some great information about what that entails and um, what that means. So you'll have that as a resource. And then look, this is amazing. Look at that. Your 2122 coalition holidays. So you'll get a resource that goes with this as well. And you'll be able to select those holidays exciting stuff for this upcoming year. And then here's the curriculum, but you can get that off of, off of the Florida Office of Early Learning website. And then we will also give this to you as a resource for yourself, just to make sure that your curriculum is the latest, greatest curriculum that is approved by the Office of Early Learning. All right, we're getting to the end, everybody, for school readiness, at least. Here's that lovely form that I'm gonna be giving to you all. You will get this as an attachment that's at E-Verify. This is what we are saying, which is now new and embedded into your contract. So what you're gonna be doing with this E-Verify per your school readiness or your BPK program, each one of you will be completing and submitting this. You'll be putting it into your profile. So it will go into your profile, not your, um, It'll go on your document tab. Make sure it's not in your document library. It's going to be in your document tab. And then this just talks about what that E-Verify is. And I think we are probably to the end here. Because I'm not going to go through this whole E-Verify. You're going to have a copy yourself of the school readiness contract. How about that? We made it through. We're going to take a little break before you know we go into BPK, but does Anyone have any questions pertaining to the school readiness contract at this point? Anything, anyone? Is everybody quiet? The question, what is the due date for the contract? The due date for the contract or the profile? Because the profile contract. is due May 1st, but the contracts will start July 1, but there really isn't so much as a like due date on school readiness. Um, you know, well, here's the thing with, with, with as far as a due date of the contract, right? The contract has to be executed by 7 1 for continuous services. But, um, you know, if we can have those by June 1st, that, that would be extremely beneficial. Uh, what we don't want to see is everyone, you know, I think that's probably what we'll do is we'll say, hey, you know, June 1st is going to be the deadline to submit school readiness contracts. They were just put in the portal. I gotcha. They were last night. So we'll probably make a, a you know, a deadline of June 1st or thereabouts uh, to, to submit those contracts so that we have time to process those. So, so no one, um, there's no lapse in anyone's contract. We have to have time to process those. Uh, anyone heard if reimbursements may increase as minimum uh, wage increases? 
you know, as of right now, there aren't any scheduled uh, reimbursement rate uh, increases. We just had a substantial increase in, in January. Um, you know, I do know that there are, um, you know, there are talks about increased increased funding at the state. Uh, we're continuously advocating for increased funding at the state level to increase, uh, you know, provider rates uh, on a local level. And, you know, as, as we hear that information or as we receive that additional funding, we're able to do that. Uh, but there aren't any specific things on the books, uh, you know, right now for any rate increases in the future. Um, and again, we just had that one in January. Uh, I thought at the beginning it was said that the profile was due by May 5th. The profile is due May 1st. That's been in almost every update we've sent um, probably since, I know at least probably January. Uh, I've also sent a couple emails out recently, uh, May 1st. So the profile is due uh, by close of business on, or it's not close of business because we're closed, but it's due by May 1st. So you can stay up as late as you want on May 1st. I don't see any other questions. And again, we can't initiate a contract until that profile is complete. So that's why we won't, don't want there to be delays in us initiating contracts. That's why it's so critical to get your profiles done and submitted because the contract will feed off of the profile. All right, if we don't have any questions, uh, Let's let's do a, a five minute break for everyone so that you can have a minute to stand up or greet something to drink or something and then we'll continue back with uh, the VPK side. So let's just call it uh, one. So 155 will return and do VPK.
Welcome back, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here. All right. We're going to talk a little bit now as we move into the next contract. It's the VPK contract. So for those of you that are, um, you know, rejoining us, welcome. And we're going to move on to now the another program, the VPK program. Thankfully, the BPK contract is not as long as the school readiness one. So same thing, you're going to have some resources. And this resource here is a wonderful visual of what's going to be uh, you know, required within your BPK contract. And just know there's two pieces on the BPK side. So when it comes time to contracting for BPK, you have your BPK 20, which is your contract. And then you have your BPK application. And that BPK application is your BPK 10, your BPK 11A, and your BPK 11B. So that's going to be when you put your classes in, your calendar, your hours for BPK, that's going to be on that piece. Just keep in mind as you're doing your BPK applications this year, because we found that all too well with COVID, um, no shared calendars this year. So each classroom will have their own calendar. So when you, re when you create a classroom, create a calendar for that classroom. I know if you are running on the same time, still create a calendar. If you have class A, create calendar B, A. If you have a class B, create a calendar B, so on and so forth. Same thing with this piece that when you're looking at that, making sure that your DCF license is current, no lapse in any of those dates in between the license. Same thing with your liability. We don't want to see any lapse in liability. Uh, we want to make sure that that liability covers the beginning of your program all the way to the end of your program. And then I'll let you go through when you have your own copy of this, all of the items use this, you know, it's a great cross reference. Talks about stuff if, uh, you know, as owner, as the director, lead instructors, as you're going through making sure you have those documents in there. When you do your VPK application, there is a brand new good moral character, it's newer. It came out May 2019. So if you've had a break in employment with your staff or you hire a new employee, you will, will be required to complete that new good moral. So best practices as we roll into the new contract here would just be to fill out and it is attached to your documents um, for your packet for VPK as a reference, just to fill out the new one. That way you won't even have to worry or think about it. Just complete it and upload it. For your profile, I know we've had a couple of questions again with your profile. Your, again, your 2122 profile just doesn't appear. It's kind of hidden. You need to make sure when you're doing your 2122 profile, first off, you need to make sure that your 2021 is in an active status because you won't be able to submit that 2122. Yes, items do feed over from the 2020 one profile to the 2122 profile. Not all things will, but when you are in your 2021 profile, again, like I said at the top, if you look to the top, if you haven't done so already, there's this little tiny tab at the very top, and it says on there, um, let me see if I can find a picture on this one. There's a little tab when you're in your profile. Right there, it'll say program year. So you're gonna actually be like you're in your 2021 profile if you don't have one active already. So when you're in your 2021 profile, you're gonna look at where it says program year. You're gonna click on that. There's gonna be a little drop down. Look where it says 2122. You're gonna click on that and then it's gonna roll over and activate your 2122 profile. That went out early sometime in January, we sent an email with a guide on those steps to switch it over from 2021 to 2122. So my, I can, you know, we can resend that out, but look back at your emails that you would have gotten somewhere around January. Um, I know it was sent out, I think again after that, but that's gonna talk about that. And we did say 21, 22 profiles are due May 1st. So if you missed it the first time, I'm saying it again because it can hold up your contracts. This is a guide that you're gonna get again in there for your profiles. 
And I'm just going to keep going through because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. If you have questions, you can reach out to, if you have problems, the help desk will assist with issues that you run into. You can reach out to myself or she, the bishop, as you're doing your profiles for that 21-22 program year. And right here is our contact information. And again, you will get this as a reference. All right, so now we're gonna roll into your VPK contract. So those of you that are joining us on the VPK piece, welcome. Glad to have you on board, those that are live and those that will be watching. We're glad to have you into, um, you know, as we roll into that 21-22 program year. Same thing through that, as we talked about, the E-Verify is gonna be new this year. Um, so with that E-Verify, everybody is gonna have to have an EIN number. And there's a little spot that we'll talk about it as we move forward. And I know Diane touched on that a little bit. So just making sure as we move into the new contract year for uh, VPK, this is a requirement of the state and a requirement of, um, you know, that we have to have these. These are the VPK certificates. We do need to have those VPK certificates uploaded prior to your class start date. Um, you know, we get for audit reasons, we have that looked at. There's many different reasons, but that is a requirement that is in rule and we will need that. Um, I know it'll be uploaded to the document library, but we'll get back with you all and let you know which folder all of that will be going in. There was an email that went out not that long ago that uh, gave you some guidance on where to put those. Karen, they, they would be uh, uploaded to the document library. There's a subfolder that's listed as uh, VPK child certificates. That's the folder they need to be in. Um, before we can enroll the child, the certificate needs to be uploaded with parent signature and provider signature. And then, of course, you add them to your roster as well so that we can enroll the child. <clears throat> Thanks, Diane. You're welcome. All right. So as we roll back into this contract, so obviously the purpose of this contract is you want to provide VPK services. So we're just going to keep rolling because you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in providing VPK. We know that the terms of the contract is uh, there's either a school readiness uh, school year program. I'm sorry, not school readiness, the VPK school year program, or there's a summer VPK program. The school year VPK program consists of 540 hours. And then the summer program within that contract year is 300 hours um, VPK for a school year begins not to begin before the start of the uh, district school year program and it ends June 30th for a school year program. Summer is a little bit different. Summer programs not to begin before May 1st and then again it's to end that program prior to the start of the children going back to school. There are differences in credentialing requirements just so that you all know um, as a school year program versus a summer VPK program. The hours are different and the credentialing requirements are different and so is the ratio and we'll get back on that um, with that information as we move forward. All right. Karen, I didn't know if anybody wanted to mention the 200 hour summer option. Uh, for this year, it will be a little bit different rolling into next year. So typically, um, you know, as we this year they are offering um, for this year, but not into the next contract year. This year it's yeah, um, minimum right. of 200 up to 300, but rolling into the 21-22 program year, we're not sure right now, but typically just so you know, when you get into that program, that is 300 hours, but for the rest of this 2021 year, there's a little bit of change with OEL with that. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. I can give you some guidance on that. All right, just knowing that this contract is not transferable or assignable to another entity. So just keep that in mind. Change in ownership requires a new execution of your contract. So letting us know at least 30 days out. Any contract like that, you need to let us know and it does require, if there's a change in ownership, execution of a new contract. Okay, so right here, provider type, as we talked about, the reason why you're here is you would either, either have to be a licensed child care facility, a licensed family daycare home, a licensed large care, large family child care, 
or a non-public school exempt from licensure, a faith-based child care provider, or a exempt from licensure, or obviously, you know, if we had district, district um, public school district programs as well for PPK. Okay. okay. I'm not going to get too heavy into the eligibility piece, but obviously, if you've been found guilty or um, you know pled guilty to fraud, just know that that can remove you from offering DPK services, uh, you know, for a significant period of time. And I will let you read up on that. Okay. Okay, here we go to that E-Verify. So if you see under item E, this is the new piece of the VPK contract. So you want to make sure that you acknowledge um, that you need to register with and use the E-Verify. At the end of all of um, you know, this, uh, this contract information that we're providing to you, there is a resource that does talk about the E-Verify that also went out to you all. So just know that you did get um, information as of January 1st with the whole E-Verify stuff. So it is embedded into the contract now for the 21-22 contract year. And basically what it says is that, um, you know, you represent that you do not employ or contract or subcontract with any unauthorized alien. And you'll provide that affidavit that affirms that um, this is prior to the effective of the date of your contract. So that's that attachment that we gave you all that will be uploaded, as I mentioned, into your provider portal, which is in your uh, document tab, not in your document library. And you'll be doing that whole E-Verify stuff. All right, so we're moving on. I'm not going to get into required forms too much. You can read that piece of it. Child enrollment, we'll talk a little bit about that. And that's where we were saying um, provider agrees to enroll eligible children for the BPK program only with authorization from the coalition, which will be provided in the form of a child certificate of eligibility from the single statewide information system. And you agree to obtain and complete with parent an eligibility certificate form, which is the OEL BPK2 or the form OEL BPK4. And that's where, you know, we were saying it's really important that you're uploading those into your, uh, we do have to have those uploaded as where Diane stated previously. Okay, as we go to the requirements, here we go. So adherence to the requirements. So you agree to deliver the BPK program in accordance with all of the requirements that are set forth within statute, rule, and your contract. So again, really know these contracts inside and out. So when we talk about assessment, as of right now, yes, there's a BPK assessment that is required for BPK. And so that VPK assessment is the, um, the voluntary, you know, the, the VPK assessment that you see that has the AP1, which means assessment period one, assessment period two, and then there's an assessment period three. So it's a pre and post assessment. You do have to register, you'll get a provider ID that will be through um, Bright Beginnings and Ashley Schultz. Um, I know, I think she's on here, so I'm going to throw her out there. Uh, you can get in contact with Ashley Schultz because each of you, as you roll into the new contract year, uh, if you're low on your VPK assessment materials, you'll be ordering, um, you know, your, your, not your new kits, but you'll get replacement kits unless you have a lot of wear and tear, or if you open a new classroom, then what you've had, you can order a new one. But outside of that, you'd be ordering your replacement materials. And if you're a brand new provider, you will have your provider ID that will be assigned to you and you will be ordering your BPK assessment materials, which is a pre and post assessment that is required. You do have to administer that for BPK. And so um, we will be ordering all of your materials, which is free to you all through uh, Bright Beginnings. Curriculum, just know as we talk about your curriculum for BPK, a little bit different than your school readiness program. If you, um, are offering a BPK, you do have more flexibility in what you want to choose as far as curriculum. Obviously, it needs to be developmentally appropriate. Um, you know, it prepares children for early literacy, all the bullets that are within here, unless you are a pro, uh, deemed a provider on probation. If you're deemed a provider on probation, you've either, you've got two choices, one being that is curriculum, 
And if you do choose to have curriculum, there are training requirements that go with that. And there are specific curriculums that you have to choose. The other option would be staff development. There are target areas, which is additional things that you have to do with that. Um, but under staff development, there's training that uh, are required even prior to the start of your, um, making sure you have those trainings for staff prior to the start of the DPK program. As of right now, um, you know, in accordance with OEL that we know for this uh, year, this current program year coming up, there isn't gonna be a new readiness rate. So those of you that are providers on probation, um, if, and you know who you are, if you're a provider on probation right now, you will remain as such into the, the next contract year. So you'll continue unless you decide and you'll get with Ashley if you wanna switch to one or the other, but you'll continue on your plans and your training. With that being said, make sure because Ashley does monitor that and if you are a provider on probation, make sure that you're following through on what those requirements are. We ran into a couple of hiccups this year, but it is grounds for termination and um, not being eligible to continue with DPK. So, you know, it is important that you, um, you continue that. And I'll talk a little bit more about what is provider on probation. What does that mean as we move forward for those of you that are new? Okay. Required parent information. So this is that the provider agrees that you will provide a copy of your attendance policy to the coalition before contract execution and to the parent of each child, the time the child is admitted into the provider's VPK program. So you will adopt your own. So basically what that attendance policy, it requires the parents to verify each month that the child's attendance on the forms prescribed in the Office of Early Learning Rule agrees not to amend its VPK program attendance policy for the duration of the contract. So you will create your own, your own attendance policy. And when you upload those, just know that it is in rule. Once you have them in there, pay attention to what you have on those attendance policies um, for dates and things of that nature if we have to take it back because once your contract is certified, that attendance policy cannot be amended in any way um, you know, as the provider for the course of the program year. Fees, fees prohibited. So just so you know, with DPK, there are no fees associated with DPK whatsoever. So even on your attendance policy, you cannot be charging parents for fees in any form, fashion with DPK. DPK is a free program for parents, so you cannot be charging parents for anything that's associated with the DPK and you can read those pieces, but that is in your contract. Okay. I'm not gonna get too heavy, but I'll say with the supplemental services that you agree that in accordance with your section of the 1002.718B that you shall not require a child to enroll for or require the payment, again, of any fee or charge for supplemental services. And again, it's, it's mentioned um, you know, a few times in the contract. Okay, instructor requirements. So as we move into VPK and you have those instructor requirements, so just remember that all times for VPK with your instructors, um, you got to make sure that all that documentation for those instructors is current, valid, up to date, which includes the level two background training through Clearinghouse. Keep in mind that that does expire around every five years. So making sure that if it's getting close to that time with your staff, or yourself that you're getting those background trainings renewed because that is a non-compliance. Same thing with your instructors for them to be employed. You got to make sure that you know any of um, if they have FCC PCs or CDAs or as you're being the director for VPK, making sure that any of those credentials are not expiring and that uh, you know especially for those lead instructors, you want to make sure that those credentials are staying up to date from ones that have those expiration dates. As we get to that VPK class staffing, remember for VPK, I talked about a little bit different, a school year versus the summer program. So for a school year class, and remember your capacity trumps all. So if your capacity is less than this, then you have to go by what's with the capacity of that classroom. However, the ratio, the typical ratio of a classroom is one to 11 or a two to 20 for a school year program. And then for a summer program, that is a one to 12 and there is no um, budge on either one of those. It's one, unless it's lower than, 
like I said, with capacity, you can't go exceed those, um, those ratios for DBK. Substitute instructors. As we talk about your substitutes that come in, just making sure that they meet the requirements within that rule and know that there is a credentialing requirement. Um, now, now with those uh, substitute instructors, the minimum is the 40 hours and it goes up from there. Also making sure that when you have your substitute instructors, that while uh, your substitute instructors are in the classroom, they are to be replacing while that instructor is absent and um, for that day or hour, whatever it is, but it can't be that that instructor is in the hallway making copies because that's not the intent of the substitute. The intent of the substitute is for that instructor to be off premises. They need to be off premises. There is a limited 30% rule that is your responsibility to be tracking that. So there is 30% uh, for your VBK program's total instructional hours. So remember that's 30% rule for those uh, total instructional hours for subs in the VBK classrooms. Obviously prohibited forms of discipline. You can look through that, those pieces yourself. The statewide information system, just making sure that everything is being, um, you know, maintained within the statewide information system. Um, any changes, things like that, it's going to be, uh, you know, put in that statewide system. Same thing when we talked earlier about that Riley Wilson Act, just making sure if any of your, um, you know, high risk children, any of those BG1 children that you're reporting those absences, like we talked about earlier, that is so, so, so important. VBK logos, I'm not going to go into that, but just know that OEL does have ways that you can and cannot be using those VBK logos. This is a great reference. If you go into the provider deliverables here, it gives you some uh, great information that talks about 540 hours for a school year program versus the 300 hours. It talks about, you know, VBK child attendance on there. Um, liability insurance. And the big one here is what I talked about before that VPK assessment. Again, it's in here again because it is critical. It is important and it is a requirement. Failure to administer a pre and post assessment can be removal of your VPK program for five years. So they are very serious about that. So your uh, to stay in compliance with the VPK assessment, again, that's going to be done through Bright Beginnings. And that will be Ashley Schultz that can provide some information on that. Your assessment period one is going to be that within the first 30 calendar days. That includes holidays, weekends. You'll be administering an assessment, the little flip book. You'll have these little bookets, booklets. You'll be scoring the children on a one or a zero, but make sure that you're filling it out completely, all the information in it. We've seen some very creative ways that um, that you know individuals have been scoring. So just make sure those booklets are fully completed. Um, AP two is mid-program year. And then AP3, which is means assessment period three, is within the last 30 calendar days of your class schedule. So keeping that in mind. I know some of you hear this 45, 45 out there. Just remember, it's 30 days. That 45 total days is they give you a 15 extra grace day period, basically, to get that information not assessed with children. That's still within 30 days, but to get their data into the Bright Beginning system to get it su submitted into the system. So best practices would be just to follow everything as closely and assess those children within 30 days. And if you can get the information in to the Bright Beginnings by that time, that would be your best bet. Okay. Gonna keep going. I'm not gonna go through forms approved. Training and technical assistance in child eligibility, because we talked about that a little bit. Um, we talked about the child certificate of eligibility. Okay, and then we're gonna talk here about monitoring, auditing, and access. So as you know, for VPK, we do have to monitor 100% of all of you. So just making sure um, you know that when we get in contact with you, either when we're you know face-to-face, -face, whatever way that we get back out there, but making sure that you give us physical access. You do need to give us physical access to your building, um, you know, staying in compliance with all of the rules of your contract. And so we will be monitoring those programs. And same thing, I know it's a pain, but we need to get record access to, um, you know, documents. So it could be that we're looking at signing out sheets, um, what's called parental choice certificates. And you all know that, AKA long and short forms. 
So those long and short forms basically stay at the end of the month. Um, especially we we see more than um, most. We see the short forms. Very rarely do we see the long. You can use either or, but most people use the short form. And basically, you know that at the end of the month, the parent signs off on that. The last week at the end of the month, not the beginning of the month, unless something happens and it's a holiday, you catch a parent and they're out at the very end, you can catch them. But it is at the end of the month, they sign off on those short forms. Um, you are required to have to do that for BPK and the signing out sheet. So we do need to see those. So there'll be some um, you know, documents that we're gonna have to see. Obviously keeping your records confidential, maintaining your records. So again, we can't stress this enough. There is a five-year rule uh, with school readiness, with BPK, there's that five-year rule. So it's making sure that you have all of the files and records and of your substitute instructors, your director um, for five years. So that's those, you know, those certificates that we need, the, um, the assessment booklets, all of that stuff so that you're maintaining that stuff. Should you close, uh, you know, permanently cease to offer VPK before the conclusion of the VPK program, you need to hand over all of those records to us. That is a requirement. So we do need those and it talks a little bit about that. So make sure you pay attention to items 33 and 34. Okay, so I know compensation, people love their payments. I know you like your money. So as we talk about this a little bit, this is gonna be important pieces. I'm gonna go through this. So attendance documentation, you agree to document the daily attendance to certify the monthly attendance and to certify the annual cumulative attendance of each child in your BPK program. So again, making sure that you're, um, so signing an out sheet that the providers aren't signing out for the parents, it should be who's authorized to sign for that child, making sure that they're signing those children in and out for the day. Those short forms are being completed uh, each month for the children within the program as it is required for BPK. Okay, and so when we get down to direct deposit, just making sure if there's any changes in your direct deposit, anything like that, you know that you're notifying us of that. So you could read that piece. I'm not gonna get heavy into that. Advanced payment, I'm not gonna to get too much into that, but there is an advanced payment option. Um, if you want more information, please let me know about that. Not too many people do that. You know, they pay in advance if something happens, just know that there is a chance that you would have to pay that back. If you want more information, you can read out, reach out to myself or Deborah Moore on that piece of it for a school year program. So when you get to your contract, you're gonna check one of these options. Um, so it's gonna to toggle between. And then same thing, if you want, decide that you wanna offer summer VPK, it's gonna to toggle between one of these three and then you'll select one of those three. And then with final payment, same thing for reimbursement, just um, you know, you can read up on that section where it talks a little bit about the final payment for BPK at the, um, that the BPK program year. Um, you can read up on that what that final payment piece is. And overpayment, at the end of the year, reconciliation of payment reveals that the provider received payment in excess of the amount owed to the provider. The coalition will offset the overpayment against the final payment owed to the provider for the program year and any further payment issued to a provider for the early learning programs. I'll let you read the rest of that, but you can read both of those pieces. I'm trying to keep y'all awake here. <laughs> Attendance documentation. This is a big piece, okay? Now I need you to stay awake on this piece because we see this quite often. So the attendance documentation submission, you agree again to submit monthly attendance cert uh, certification in accordance with that rule, which is statute for payment. You agree that you're submitting all required attendance records to the coalition on or before the third business day of each month. If the due date falls on a holiday, you agree to submit all the required attendance records to the coalition on the preceding business day. Don't say I didn't tell you again because I just told you. So reimbursement summary for review. Again, provider agrees to review the reimbursement summary provided with the monthly reimbursement statement. So again, the provider agrees to report to the coalition any discrepancy 
overpayment or underpayment within 60 calendar days. So make sure those two pieces, um, you know, we see that missed. So again, don't say I didn't tell you because I just did. Okay. Closure. So right here, you agree any compensation for a temporary closure will be handled in accordance with what's in rule. And we know that all too well with what's going on this year with COVID. Need I say more? All right, so we're gonna keep moving on. I'm not gonna go through the whole disallowed cost head start in Title 20 schools. I've gotta give you some reading material so you can read up on that at your leisure. Readiness rates. So this is what I was talking about before when I said provider on probation. So um, right now, as I mentioned, that there is no readiness rate for this year. However, typically what happens in this, so each year, um, you know, your, your VPK children go off to kindergarten and within those first 30 days that they're in kindergarten, they get um, screened of what's called the flickers. So they use the flickers as, you know, a term, which is the Florida kindergarten readiness screener. I had to think about that. So under that, they pick a tool. The STAR early literacy tool currently is what is then um, selected. So basically what that does is that does determine um, you need a certain rate, a certain threshold that you have to fall in between and it determines the readiness of the children, which does go back to the BPK providers. So um, if it's, if the provider fails to meet what that rate is, um, they can be put on what's called, they would be called a provider on probation. So they would be put on certain um, plans. So they would either be doing, um, like we said, curriculum trainings, or they would be doing staff development. And if it happens the second year, they'll continue to maintain it after a third year. If they fail to meet the mini minimum readiness rate, that can lead them to removal from eligibility to offer BPK for a period of five years. So there is high stakes with that. Um, there is, if that happens after the third year, you could apply for a good cause exemption, which would allow you to, um, to continue to, should you get the good cause exemption, uh, you would be allowed for one year to provide services for BPK. Okay, and so um, again, for probation, you understand that in accordance with what's in statute, that uh, a provider on probation must continue the corrective actions in your improvement plan of what you selected in your staff development until you meet that readiness rate. Failure to do so can result in termination of your contract and losing eligibility to deliver your program for five years. And this is where I said this is really critical for those of you that are providers on probation right now. Make sure that you are maintaining um, whatever it is that you've chosen. We ran into you know, a couple of hiccups this year, but we wanna make sure that you're staying in compliance with what it is if you are a provider on probation um, as far as training. Okay. Financial consequences, just know that there is a possibility if you fail to provide the minimum level of services that were required within your contract that we can withhold payment. Um, there can be some financial consequences which could lead up to termination of the contract. And then I'll let you read more on the um, non-compliance determination corrective action notice. Uh, basically, you know, I'm not gonna go into uh, a bunch of detail with this, but if you had a corrective action plan that you would be needing to complete that and then failure, you know, to that can lead to uh, further uh, corrective action. Okay, termination for cause. Just know that the coalition has the right to terminate the contract for a cause at any time. Okay, we're almost there, people. We're almost there. Emergency termination. The coalition must immediately terminate the contract if an emergency basis upon a notification by DCF. Just know that that can happen. And then um, revocation of eligibility, same thing. Um, I'll let you read up on that. You could be removed for five years if your contract is terminated under those conditions that fall under 54 and 55. So make sure that, you know, as, as we're saying, if it's an emergency uh, termination or termination for cause, that could lead up to five years removal from BPK. Okay, we're getting there. I'm not going to go into the legislative, legislative appropriation. I'll let you read up on that. 
I'm not going to go too heavy into the fraud, um, but I will, you know, same thing, just making sure that you're, um, you know, you're not committing fraud. And then termination for fraud can be for a period of five years and the USDA disqualified list, making sure that you're not on that. And if you are letting us know within five days. Due process, I'm not going to read too much on that. Again, you can read up on that on your own. Same thing with um, these items here, litigation, litigation. I'll let you read up on those pieces, 61 and 62. Okay, information change. Obviously, same thing, letting us know if there's class transfers. Make sure you let us know that if there's any changes with your VPK application. Your 10, your 11A, your 11B, uh, instructor changes, sub changes, director changes. You need to let us know. You have that 14 day window to let us know. Um, temporary closures, letting us know. Same thing if you have a, a temporary closure or um, any reason for dismissal of children, letting us know that within those 14 days. Okay, so CCRNR, same thing making sure that in your profile, all of that information is being kept up to date, which would be like if you've had changes, you know, emergency contact changes, any of that information, your profile needs to be updated. Sometimes that does trigger amendment. Unusual incident, this is a, an important one. So making sure that you report any unusual incidents to the coalition no later than the close of business, the next business day. When, and you need to submit something to us in writing within three business days from the date of the incident. So just making sure that you are staying in contact. If you're not sure if it's an unusual incident or not, let us know. It's better to let us know what's going on than not let us know when something happened later. Okay, so same thing, just this notice of disqualification. I'm gonna let you read up on that. And like I said, if, um, you know, letting us know if USDA within five days. I'm not gonna get into the indemnify piece. You can read up on that as well. I said I do have to give you some reading material. Um, severability, you can read up on that. Amendments, just know that you know there could be amendments with your contract, and those are electronic. Like I said before, with school readiness, same thing. Your amendments are hidden in your contract where your uh, VPK 20 is. There's a little plus sign when you get into that section, and you'll click on where your contracts are. You'll see them in there. If you see a little plus, it'll open up and your contract is hit, or your uh, amendment is hidden in there if you have an amendment. I don't know why they hide them, but they're hidden. Okay. Now we get to the execution of the contract. Here we go. So this is the fun piece. So once we have contracts ready, profiles done, profiles done, then contracts ready, you're going to sign off on those those babies. So uh, make sure when you sign them, it is on the top signature line, whoever that authorized individual is. Again, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be your title. It's going to jump up and it's going to look like it says your signature, but you're actually going to put your title in owner, director, whatever you are, then it'll flip and then you'll be able to put your name in just a little, um, you know, uh, give you a little side note on that because we've seen somebody that we have to send back and then you'll click on the electronic signature. And this is how I know that you're going to be listening all the way to the end. You didn't fall asleep because I just said that. So those of you that are putting your signatures, when I say do your title and then it'll flip to your signature, I'm going to know if you're paying attention. Okay. Same thing. If you want to add an additional signer, you can add additional signers. And then these are just the pieces that will trigger based off of um, whatever is that you selected for your contract. I'm not going to get into all of that stuff here. So those big pieces are, you know, paying attention to your subs, your liability insurance, your license, VPK director changes, um, workers' compensation, reemployment insurance. Just know that you don't have to have that in your profile, but we do have to check for that, especially when we're doing VPK monitoring. So that's your 940 or your RT6. We'll, we will be looking at that stuff, so just making sure that you somehow have um, provided us with those documents when we need them. All right. Any questions for VPK? Here we have, just so that you can see real quick, this is subject to change. Should you decide you're not required to follow the calendar for school district, many of you like to. So should you decide to, um, this is the, uh, which is posted on the website with the Polk County Schools, but just know that right now these dates are subject to change. This isn't the final version, but it is in here. 
So you have that. And this was the good moral character that I was talking about. So again, I'm gonna know if you're watching all the way to the end and you're paying attention because this is the newest good moral character that I said is dated 2019. You'll see right here. And so there's some subtle changes to it, not many. Make sure you fill it out completely, including the second page where you would have your site in there because we have to send it back if it's not completed. So we want we don't want to be delaying stuff. And then down here, um, you're just going to get somebody that is going to be a witness. So with that somebody is going to either be the owner or the director. Um, if you are the, and, and most people don't have that, but there are some that do have um, their, their self as both the um, owner and the director of the program in the classroom and they're signing. You don't have to sign the bottom. I mean, you can, but you don't have to sign the bottom because um, I guess you have to be your own witness. And so I don't know how you would be your own witness, but maybe. Okay, and then there's a quick guide reference for submitting your attendance that Kenneth provided for the BPK side as well. So that is pretty cool. Here's that short form that I was saying before. This is a visual for you. So this is what it looks like. You will have to have this. This is a requirement of BPK. There's no way around this. You do have to have this in. Make sure you have the one with the floor to seal. That's the um, newer version. This is all going to be filled out. Don't leave any of these spaces blank. You're going to put the attendance month. This is the short form one. It's going to be the attendance month and year. You're going to put the print name of the parent, and then you're not going to do this. The parent is going to sign, not you, the parent, and the date they're going to sign. Um, the date that they did the signature is going to be um, when they sign that. And again, that's at the end of the month, not at the beginning of the month. And this is that e-verify, again, um, for you all that you will have to fill out one for school readiness and then as well for VPK depending on what program you have. And then this is the VPK assessment. Remember I said that is a requirement of VPK. There's going to be a lovely attachment that you're going to have that's going to tell you the purpose of the assessment, the deadlines of the assessment, and when it's um, due and when it's not due and what um, uh, what individuals as far as they have to do AB2. If you're a provider on probation and you staff development, you do have to do all three, AP1, assessment period one, assessment period two, and assessment period three. However, for everybody, best practices would be just to do all three. And that tells you where, again, through Bright Beginnings, uh, where you will go to order your materials, and that's also where you're going to go to put your, uh, your information in for the children. It's on that attachment. And there's the lovely E-Verify attachment as well. That's going to give you some information what that e-verify means. And I'm not going to read through all of that. You can read that because you'll have a copy of it. And I believe that we are at the end of the VPK section. So do we have questions? If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the QA box. Yeah, put them in that QA. No VPK question. Was I that thorough? Ah, oh, there it goes. E-learning for next year. I'm assuming that's you know talking about VPK Flex. As of right now, we have not heard any um, any talk about allowing VPK Flex for. Um, next fiscal year for 21 22. We have not heard anything um, about that. I will add, we anticipate that it probably will not be permitted next year. But again, we haven't heard officially one way or the other. All right. Well, I, you know, if you're typing questions, we appreciate all that you are doing, you know, within the community to serve the children and the families. And I know it's been a crazy year for everybody. And we truly, truly appreciate you, you know, staying in communication with us throughout the course of the year. And we're excited to have you back for 
you know, the 21-22 program year. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen and Nancy and Melinda um, and all the staff that participated. Uh, looks like I do have something that just pulled up. Uh, I will say, you know, again, thank you to all the providers for all that you do. Uh, also, uh, if you are watching this, uh, now would be the point uh, where you will, uh, if you're watching this online, uh, not attending the meeting today, now will be the point where you will complete your, your attestation that you have viewed it, and then you will um, send that in to us. Uh, let's see if I can pull this question up. Uh, do we have to put the VPK certificate in the portal this year? Uh, I'm assuming the child certificate answer is yes. I believe Diane referenced that earlier. I believe it, I, the folder is VPK. It's in the document library. It's the folder VPK child certificate. And we are asking providers to, uh, for this year to upload the ones if they have any new enrollments. We have not asked for you know, children that have been enrolled prior to but if you had any new enrollments, um, we were asking for the providers to do that. All right, anything else? Any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you everyone for participating. We look forward to, uh, to having you guys for, for another year. All right. Well done, Karen. Congratulations for another beginning of a year. And thank you everybody else for all your work.